Hello, everyone, and welcome back to a, another week. I'm a, I'm a little stuffy this week, so please forgive me He's if I sound kind of nasally. I apologize. <laughs> I am Reverend Rebecca Zardi. I am the Director of Ministry with Women for the Cumberland Presbyterian Church, for the Ministry Council for the Cumberland Presbyterian Church. Sorry, missed that. Miss that. I'm telling you, she's um, and been in the job now for I know, months. Three months. She can't say that. Yeah. I'm the Adult Ministries Coordinator for the Ministry Council <laughs> of the Cumberland Presbyterian Church. <laughs> My name is Chris Chris. by the way. <laughs> How are you today? Um, you know, I'm enjoying life. This is my favorite day, uh, or at least the day that we will study this officially is my favorite day of yes. all the year. It's the most wonderful time of the year. I, it, it is because he has risen. He is risen indeed, Reverend. Hallelujah. I got to say it first yeah. that time. Very good. Yeah, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. Today, we're looking at the lesson for Sunday, April 17th. It is Easter Sunday. It's Resurrection Sunday. So I'm really excited that we're going to be in this lesson today. Yeah. Our scripture reading today comes from John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. Before we get into that, was there anything you want to talk about? We've been talking about the why the young adult cohort. Um, yeah, I would just else? say, just remind people, if you know somebody that's a young and post high school, probably pre 30 would make it easier. Um, uh, we're doing the uh, spiritual disciplines cohort. Uh, and I'm really excited about that. We if still you know have anybody, some spots available. Some spots yeah, are available. So. So bring it on. Um, bring it in. I think I'm going to, I keep telling people this just to create a deadline for myself. Uh, we are working on providing a new way of delivering content uh, via our, I'm not, I don't want to call it a website, but we will have a, a new means, hopefully an app for your phone, app for your TV, and, a, and another website, I'll say another website, to deliver resources to the church. And I'll, I'll give people more info on that later, but I'm excited to be working on that. And I hope to have at least the web site and phone app up within I'm going to say the first of May is going to be my goal and so look forward to sharing that with everybody mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. very excited that, about that's all that I got for right now another way of being able to communicate and connect with people I mean that's that's what we want we want to be huge. able to connect with you so huge um, it's, it's huge I can say that right now because I'm really stuffy so I'm going to be huge that's <laughs> terrible <laughs> <laughs> that's terrible okay so today our memory verse comes from john 20 verse 9 it says for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead let's start with our prayer for illumination holy god majestic god redeeming god the adjectives to describe you are endless enlarge our minds and hearts today to receive your word Make your light shine so that we can see through the darkness and doubt that too often holds sway in our lives. In the name of the risen Jesus, we pray. Amen. Mm. Amen. Chris, you are our writer for this week, yes. for this beautiful Easter Sunday, this Resurrection Sunday. And you start us off with some really good reflection questions. You say, what does the resurrection mean to the world, to the church? To each of us as individuals, what would it mean if Jesus was still in the grave? Those are some pretty deep thoughts to begin this week. It's a big week. And it's... It is a big week. And hopefully um, you've had a beautiful and amazing Holy Week and have been able to participate in different kinds of services this week. But this is, uh, this is, this is like, a, this is a big Sunday for us. I don't want to say Super Bowl Sunday, but it's a big Sunday. Yeah. So Easter Sunday, uh, we'll get into it in this next section, but it's, it's a very important day for me, but it's a rolling day, right? So it, I, I mean mm -hmm. that it's not like July 4th, every year is July 4th. It's, it's a rolling holiday. And so different and various events of my life happened on different days, but always on Easter. So my uh, conversion experience was at an Easter sunrise service. Um, and of course, like I said, we'll talk about, you know, my brother died on Easter and then just it's, I remember my first Easter communion as a pastor, uh, giving it to my congregation, and just the, just Easter is this beautiful day for me, in, in some mm -hmm. ways, heart wrenching and beautiful at the same time. So, um, sure. I'm glad we get to just talk about it a little bit. Um, so, I guess through those things, I guess what I'm trying to say is, much of my life has been 
my spiritual life for sure has been marked by Easter. And so the resurrection, what it means to me is it's this continual journey, this calling from darkness to light, and then this journey of failing and victory in Christ. And um, so I think that's what it means to me. It just, it has a special place. Mm-hmm. For various and Absolutely. And, and it, and it should, I think in all, in all of Christians lives, um, you know, these reflection questions, and, and we've talked a, a little bit about this, but without the resurrection, and we'll get into that more without the resurrection, what would, what would our religion mean? What would it actually be? What would our belief system be without that? So ponder that as we dive in teachers, as we dive into this, because we're going to dig into that question a little bit later and a whole lot deeper um, as we get into some of the conversation later. But these are really good thoughts to have at the beginning of your class to just get a basic understanding of where your people are at and where they understand and how they understand um, the resurrection. What does it mean? Yes. And I would want to highlight in... um in the introduction, mm-hmm. the, the resurrection is also a rejection of rote religion. Uh, it's a, it's a rejection of saying that religion is the key to saving you. It's not, it's the fact that Jesus Christ died and rose. And that means because he did that, he overcame what religion can't do. Religion can never make us yes. into a internally pure person. Uh, we could be really great like the Pharisees and we could check off every box, but then we're still left with our pitiful selves. But in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we're given the Holy Spirit, we're forgiven, and, and we're inspired to live better on a higher plane, not on, you know, we don't live by the law, we live by the Spirit. It's a beautiful thing. That's right. right. Absolutely. Yeah. It's an amazingly beautiful thing. <clears throat> so you say right before the exploring scripture, you say our lesson today explores the consequences of that early Christian greeting. Christ is risen. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. So let's get into our exploring scripture. I knew some of this story before I read this, but I didn't know this depth of the story. And, and y'all, it made me cry when I read this. What um, we talked about this before, Chris, but I never really understood or understood this part of the story. So you want to explain this part of the story to us? Um, yeah, I, I can. And and I know like I would all I would start by saying obviously this is a sensitive thing. Probably my mom and dad are watching this, you know, and I know sure. that this was probably the worst moment of their life ever. It wasn't a good time for me, but it has caused us all to think about what what this whole Jesus thing is about. Um, my mm-hmm. parents, obviously, they've lost their moms and dads. I have not done that my brother was probably the first person in which I lost that just, it didn't seem right. Like I'd lost grandparents, Mm -hmm. but you know, when I was younger, they were older and I could at least understand this is the way of, this is the way of the world. You get older and, and, and you pass away. It was the first time my brother was 32 years old. Um, and so that's not supposed to happen. Right. Or like, you know, my mom said, you know, you're not supposed to bury your kid. It's supposed to be the other way around. Right. So, um, so I get that, and I would like to pause and, and at least acknowledge that. But um, so anyway, just for whatever reason, my brother had been in the army. He he was older than me by about six years or so, and so like you know, once once he got out of high school, uh, we didn't really get to hang because he was in Korea or whatever, and we just didn't we didn't have a whole lot of time together. And so uh, back in two thousand and eight, he had a car wreck, which kind of slowed him down on on some of his activities and uh he couldn't drive or really do do too much and so it was an opportunity for him to you know, he really never knew me before I became a preacher or wanting to be a preacher and so we got to start going to church together I'd pick him up and and we'd go to church together and, and it was just a time that we we spent time together and so it was kind of nice in that sense um but then just complications from that wreck uh mm-hmm. happened and then on Easter Sunday that one Sunday uh I you know, called. I was going to pick him up. We were going to go to church. It was the last Sunday of the church I was at before I became the full-time pastor at Margaret Hing Church. So uh, it was that Easter Sunday. I would have moved to Paducah that next, that next week. Um, but anyway, just something went haywire and, and, you know, he, he passed away and it was, it was a shock. It was also a moment when, when I was in the, um, 
chapel, you know, the little waiting room at the ER mm -hmm. where a chaplain came in and I thought, not going to do this job. Like, right. Like hospital chaplain sure. out of the question. Um, because I thought this would be the, especially at the time I was like, this would be the most horrible job anybody could ever have. And so I did, and, yeah, but it's yeah. always been then something that I've prayed for hospital chaplains because I couldn't imagine that. Like that's their job is to kind of be, you know, the presence of God and probably someone's worst situation ever. And I, you'd have to be really prayed up every single day to be able to do that job. So to face that. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So anyway, that's the context. And the reason why, while this exploring the scripture, there's not a lot of context, except that Every single one of us will experience this. Every single yes. one of us will have somebody that we deeply love die. And it's no different 7,000 years ago or 10,000 years ago. It hurts and it's not right. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's the reoccurring theme of humanity. You're going to die. You are, your friends are, your loved ones. Everybody's going to die. Yes. What are we going to do about it? And everybody. And so that's what's encapsulated, I think, in, in these last couple of verses in John or chapters in John, and especially here where. Um, they're stunned because the person that they thought was their rock redeemer and all this stuff just was dead. It's gone. It's gone. Yeah. And what do you do? And so that's the, that's the historical and contextual context. Although I don't really talk about the contextual context as much. I do bring up, you know, a different scripture, but that it is, it's the context and it won't change. Yes. Anytime soon anyway. Yeah, I agree. Uh, you know, I think, when I think back on my life, the first person that I lost that didn't make sense to me was one of my best friends we were 13. She died in a tragic accident, you know, and at 13, it's like, that that's a shock to your system because you, you live forever, right? When you're 13 yep. and, and, and it just, it makes you realize that no, you don't. Right. And that there is there is an end at some point there has to be an end. Um, and that just makes you more aware. I love how um, 45, the second to the last paragraph, you say Christianity is certainly a force for good in the world. It can certainly change situations in the here and now, but the gospel is also the eternal significance. Yeah. I've, I've told people before, this is probably when I was younger, when I was 28, probably before I was, I was probably more progressive in my theology. But like I said, when, when somebody dies, you're like, well, who, how much can you do in this world to make a difference right. when you're going to die? And so is everybody else. And so I, I put in here in the past, I was, I was really angry with Christians who always just talked about heaven as if there was nothing to do on earth. But man, when someone you die, love, you love, when somebody dies, you love, heaven becomes more real and desirable mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and no matter how good you make the earth no matter how good you you are and even again like i said you could recreate the garden of eden and people are still going to die in it <laughs> and so there's another problem <laughs> that you got to fix so yes yeah absolutely and you you end this section with this whole interchange between Martha and Lazarus and Jesus, you know, that Martha was like, Jesus, if you'd been here, if you'd been here, my brother, my brother would live. Um, and Jesus says, you know, your brother's going to rise again. And she says, I know that he will rise again, in the resurrection of the last day. And he says these amazing words to her. I am the resurrection and the life. And those who believe in me, even though they die, will live and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die do you believe this that's a profound question as well um if you know the history of lazarus and the the tradition of of lazarus and i know we've talked about this on here before but lazarus when he came back it the tradition holds that he never again smiled that he was so concerned for human souls from what he saw on the other side of the grave those four days dead that when he returned back to earth, he was so concerned for humanity that he could never smile again because he was just so concerned for people. And that's something that I think we need to give consideration and thought to, you know, because we're like, ah, you know, we just kind of do blase fair sometimes about the Christian walk. And we don't, and maybe we're trying to make a good place here on earth, but where are those souls going? 
yeah. where are those souls ending up? And and maybe we need to be a little bit more concerned about that. Yeah, because I remember I, when I was younger, I would almost even say, and I'll admit this, it's probably not a good thing to admit, but I was almost embarrassed about when we were talking good about for the soul. Yeah, John, th- like when we were talking about the John 316 sign, sometimes I'd roll my eyes when I saw people take those into the stadium or like when I was outside walking into a sports thing and there was the uh, soapbox preacher. And it's so easy to just say that those people are crazy and nuts. But at the same time, who's, who am I to say? Because at least they're preaching the gospel and, and maybe they have too much emphasis on heaven and not enough emphasis here, but I surely at one point in my life had too much emphasis here and not enough on heaven. And not enough on heaven. I know that. I think there's a balance. I think there's, there has to be a balance between the two because it is about, about treating our brothers and sisters with respect and dignity and honesty here on earth. But it's also that care and concern for your eternal destination. It's not, it's not either, or it's both. And yeah, and I think some of it too, in my my academically minded way, was I embarrassed that I believe in an eternal soul? Like, was I embarrassed mm-hmm. because um, I believe that there was a Jesus guy who jumped up from the grave, or who did miracles like turning water mm-hmm. into wine, or so on and so forth? Sure. And I think we've talked about this before too. Now I'm okay with it again, but uh, yeah. some of it came from this experience. Like, yeah, I'm okay with it with sharing that with other people. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So your reflection question on the end of the section, you say, when was a time when the gospel became very clear to you? When has the gospel comforted you? And I think it sounds like this moment, this moment in time is when yes. the gospel became very clear that it's not just about here on earth, but it's also yeah. the future, the heaven. Yeah. Yeah. And when has the gospel comforted you? I think in those times of loss, you know, for me personally, that's, that's, I don't, I don't know if I would like to say that my friend's death when I was 13, the gospel became clear to me, but I was 13. I think when I came back to church is when the gospel became very clear to me because now I think maybe at that time I was too heavenly minded and not enough earthly minded. And so when I came back to church after I'd been out of church for a long time, that's when the gospel became clear to me because it, it wasn't the either, or it became the both. And that I need to be just as concerned about people now as I am about their eternal soul, instead of just worrying about one or the other, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and the gospel comforts me all the time yeah um all the time i mean really honestly when i have bad days when i'm feeling down and in my in my joys i just scripture just jumps yes. out to me you know and i and i'm exuberant with those people that have come home and i'm joyful and and excited about them and but at the same time those days that that i'm feeling down and i recognize myself and different people different scriptures of the bible and and what what god has done for them knowing what god's doing for me now you know it's it's very comfort it's a huge comfort for me to know that i have a god that cares for me each and every day i agree leo hi leo yeah he's (laughs) he's my jerk he's a cute jerk we'll let him hang out So then, okay, digging deeper, I loved this conversation. This was really, um, for me, it was eye-opening and very intriguing, the different viewpoints that these two people that you don't expect to take have taken. So would would you like to explain this conversation for us? Yeah, like most Christians, when I first became a Christian, I was 18, right? And I was on fire and I was gonna, most of my, most of my advances in spirituality also come from my pride, uh, sadly enough. And so like when I became a Christian, I was always worried about how people would perceive me. And so I wanted to be really smart and I wanted to show it. It's a terrible exercise, but you know, it is what it is. So I was, I was into, uh, what you would call apologetics. We've talked about that some in the past and it was a, um, 
uh, you know, it's a way of defending your faith and learning all that. And so I was introduced to all kinds of skeptics and atheists and all that jazz. And one of them that many people might be aware of, he's passed away now, but probably my favorite atheist, probably many people's favorite atheist of my age or a little bit older would be Christopher Hitchens. Um, on a side note, he has a brother over in England named Peter Hitchens, who is still alive, and they were complete opposites. Christopher Hitchens was is an, was an atheist, and Peter Hitchens is a very devout um, uh, Anglican, we'll say. Uh, and so anyway, Episcopalian, whatever they're called over there. But anyway, Christopher wrote a book called uh, God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. And I remember listening to a an interview that he gave to a Unitarian Universalist minister who did a lot of work with like NPR up in I see Al or wherever it was. I forgot where it was. And um, and I remember, again, this this was pretty close to the time that I'd talked about with my brother dying. I think it was 2009 or 10 or something. I forgot when it was. Um, but uh, the Unitarian Universalist minister says something along the lines of, well, I don't take scripture literally, and I don't think you have to believe that Jesus rose, he died and rose again. Like, she said it can be taken metaphorically. And then Christopher Hitchens was like, well, I think that's kind of, um, basically, he said it's kind of dishonest. He said, you know, the, the definition of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ was the forgiveness of sins and life everlasting. And, you know, if you don't believe that, then what do you believe? And then she doubles down on it. And she says, uh, you know, I take this as metaphorical truth. The stories, the narrative are what's important. And then I remember Christopher Hitchens saying this, and I'd never been able to put it in words. But he says, then show me what there is ethically in any religion that can't be duplicated by humanism. In other words, can you name me a single moral action performed or a moral statement uttered by a person of faith that couldn't just as well be pronounced or undertaken by a civilian or someone who wasn't part of it? And I'm like, well, he's right. Because the only thing we have as Christians is that Christ rose from the dead and because he lives, we live. Not our right. actions, not our thoughts, not our worthiness. It's because Christ died and rose again for us. That's the only difference. Right. Like I've tried to, I've tried really, really hard to figure out what other difference would be Christianity if you didn't have a resurrection. I don't know what it would be. Yeah. Yeah. On the other I, cheek. I, uh, Doing to others as you would have done to you. Like, right? Like, right. So, so the thing that sets Christianity apart from any other, and, and you and I have both studied different philosophies and different religions of the world. Um, and for any of any of our friends who have also studied different, they all present a a great viewpoint on moral and ethical behavior. Yeah. They all have they all have good points on how to be a good human being, how to treat each other with respect and dignity, how to love each other um, as we should and care for one another. But the thing that sets Christianity apart, and the thing that for us is key is this resurrection yeah. with, without the resurrection of Christ. What I, I agree, what would we have just a, a good moral teaching? Right. And, and I think it's also important to understand what the gospel is. The gospel is not a call to morality. That is absolutely not what the gospel is. The gospel is that Jesus Christ died and rose again. That is the right. gospel. It's That's not the good it's news. Not, it's not about life, moral codes, rituals, anything else. It's that God and right. Jesus Christ has redeemed the world. Yes. Through, and that's through super his, important. Through his action of, yeah. of going to the cross and rising again, it is through him going back to going back to what he said to Martha. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. And those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And it's through this resurrection, it's through this beautiful Sunday that we're celebrating, this, this amazing event that happened, that we have life, that we have life everlasting, that we, that we put our hope and our belief and our trust and our faith in so that we can have this eternal kingdom with God, that we can share and participate in this, in this yet to come, the kingdom that is here, but not yet consummated. And without that, what do we have? Yeah. And for those who are more, you know, earthly oriented, it's fine. The same way that a conservative evangelical, if you want to, says that through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, an individual soul is, is saved and, and, and we're transformed. 
what happens on an individual level happens on the global cosmos level that christ redeemed the world cosmos the whole thing Mm -hmm. and and in the same way it too is transformed through the victory of jesus christ over the grave and death and sin and evil in the same way we work on ourselves we can work on the world but ultimately our victory is this resurrection of jesus christ Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i'm done on that okay (laughs) (laughs) okay fair enough yeah uh, that to me, I think this whole conversation, you summed, you summed it up on page 47. You said, weirdly, the world's foremost atheist debater further strengthened my belief in Jesus Christ as the Messiah, the son of God raised from the dead, sitting at the right hand of God, the father almighty. Yeah. I wanted to make that pretty strong. Yeah. 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 Interesting that the atheist understood it better. I oh, think so. Again, there's going to be people who <coughs> agree that are using the encounter and, sure. and they won't agree, but that's okay. I just, it's taking it from the text and taking it from my experiences, my lived mm-hmm. experiences, then, then yeah. I think, uh, I think, I think, I think we're on to something here anyway. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Cause you, then you close this section with this discussion question and this uh, teachers, this is a, another really great discussion question to have with your students is do you believe in the literal resurrection of Jesus Christ? And do you think it makes a difference? Do you think it makes a difference if you do or do not believe in the literal resurrection of Christ? So these are great questions to, to ask your, your group. How, how is it that you see the resurrection of Christ? Is it literal? Is it metaphorical? Um, and why? And how does that make a difference? These, yeah. are, these are good things to ponder. So then in learning from the scripture, you take us back to what we've been talking about in John, that John is very careful to connect Jesus Christ as the Passover lamb. Um, You know, we're, again, we're bringing this back around to this is who Jesus was. You know, he, he was the symbolic Passover lamb um, that John made it very clear that no bones are broken. You know, he, he brought all of this back, all the scriptural text back to us that he was the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Um, and for, and for this reason, he was crucified to be our Messiah, our savior, but then also through the resurrection. So hit some points in here on what you want us to understand. I shall. So like, so the Passover lamb, uh, was not just a commemoration of the Exodus. It was the celebration of God's faithfulness to the promise of Abraham to create a great nation. And through Abraham, all the Mm -hmm. world will be blessed. So in other words, the act of the Exodus and then the the participation in Passover was also, it was a proclamation of what God did. And then it was also a proclamation that God is faithful to God's promises. When Jesus Christ institutes the Lord's Supper, on the day of preparation for Passover, or he does so in the context of a Passover feast, we're proclaiming God's faithfulness to the promises to Abraham, to us, and we're also commemorating the event that made it happen. I mean, like Mm -hmm. the resurrection of Jesus Christ in some ways is like going through the the Red Sea, like he he parted death um, and brought brought us into the promised land. Mm, And so beautiful picture. One of my favorite passages of scripture um, has all, has been for a long time, all the promises of God are yes in Jesus Christ. And so what the resurrection does then, it's not that we're looking back on an event that made something possible. It did something like Jesus Christ is risen. That's the end of the story. It's not we hope Christ will rise one day or like Martha says, we, I know my brother will one day rise. But Jesus right. says, no, it's now. It's and now. it's happened. The victory yeah. in Christ is secured. And so all the promises of God then, because Jesus Christ is risen, are yes in Jesus Christ. Yeah. And so I just talk about the, the promise of forgiveness of sins from slavery to freedom, right? Mm-hmm. We have a place in which barriers are broken down, where like the culture is that people are against each other politically, racially ethnically religiously whatever blah 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 and jesus christ we're all one there's no longer jew nor gentile slave free male female whatever but we're all children of god and then we receive the holy spirit 
uh, mm -hmm. which helps us not be terrible and transforms us from one degree of glory to another when we submit. Sure. Um, and those are the promises. And we know they're true because Christ is risen. Right. Yeah. You quote John Piper and here you say, every sinner who comes to God in Christ with all his needs finds God coming to him in Christ with all his promises. When a sinful person meets the holy God in Christ, what he hears is, yes. Do you love me? Yes. Will you forgive me? Yes. Will you accept me? Yes. Yes. Will you help me change? Yes. Will you give me power to serve you? Yes. Will you keep me? Yes. Will you show me your glory? Yes. All the promises of God, all the blessings of God in the heavenly places are yes in Christ Jesus. Jesus is God's decisive yes to all who believe. Yeah. That's one of my favorite little sermons that I heard. I love that <clears throat> because yes, because yes, we're, we're changing. Yes. We, we come to Christ as we are and yes, he helps us be a transformed person, a, a, a changed human, a, a better follower, a better leader for him. Uh, you know, whatever that happens to look like, whatever you're called to do, God helps you, helps you do that. And all of these things. So you have your three promises that you point out in this section yeah. that the forgiveness of sins, a place of belonging that breaks down barriers and then the Holy spirit. Yeah, which I agree. The Holy like, Spirit does help us be a better human. <laughs> yeah, I always like to say less terrible. <laughs> less terrible. Yeah, that's the Calvinist that's, in me coming out. I'll admit it. There I, you I, go. Total we're, depravity. We're less I'm terrible. all Yeah, that's terrible. <laughs> we're less terrible than we were before. Absolutely. Um, because yeah. yes, that's what Christ does. So I think that. Um, so the the reflection question, you know, what an afterthought. I mean, like, what what promises has Christ? Or what, what does the resurrection, what does it assure in your life? What's important? Like to me, again, we've talked about our different situations. I had an experience that I hope nobody has losing a brother, right? Like mm -hmm. you're going to have yeah. it if you have a brother one way or the other, but uh, you're going to have these horrible situations, but that really did help define who I am. But the, but then it made the resurrection really, really clear to me what it, at least what I, I hold on to. And so you, sure might have had different situations if you've been somebody who's been maybe through a divorce or a nasty marriage or something like that or if you've been yeah. bullied your entire life or if you've you know just lost everything because of some stupid decisions and bankruptcy or whatever but it's not always bad like the resurrection gives me hope too and it allows me yeah. to be humble when I'm disagreeing with someone or when someone's terrible to me or, or if I'm having a great day, it's like it echoes everything because I know it's just a foretaste of what's going to happen when everything's right. Like I love mm -hmm. thinking about that too. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That is so true. That, that beautiful, I think we get glimpses of what heaven's going to be like here, understanding that it's not fulfilled yet here, but it should that resurrection and that resurrection mindset should want us. I'm going I'm to use this, this illustration, this story, and I don't know if I've ever talked about this one before. It was a, um, a pastor that was, um, came through and, and served us for a Sunday while we were searching for a pastor at a church that I was attending at the time. And he told this awesome story about how, when he was in college, he lived in this uh, like apartment complex. Um, and it was just like on the one level, but so several different homes on this one section. And in the middle of the night, the place caught on fire and they were scrambling, trying to wake up all the neighbors and get everybody out, you know, to safety, that sort of thing. And he said, who, who of you wouldn't, you know, if, if you're, if your neighbor's house is on fire, who of you wouldn't go and help? And, and try to pull people out. We're like, of course we would, you know, we're not just going to stand by and watch somebody burn, you know, you're going to yeah. help them out. And he said, but the, the point of the cross and the resurrection is the world's on fire. Yeah. And what are you doing to help your neighbor? And that always took me back because it's like, wow. <laughs> that one kind of that one kind of shocked me into the reality of of we have this beautiful kingdom now sure and it's and it's amazing and we're supposed to help our neighbors but we're also supposed to share this beautiful thing called the resurrection of christ with others this gospel message this this is who we serve 
yeah. is the risen savior. And, and through the risen savior, is your life going to be perfect here on earth? No, we're not promised that ever, but through the risen savior, we have hope in a future and a glory that we're going to share with yeah. him in heaven. Yeah. And it, and it's not a lie. It's in it's Jesus Christ lie. risen from the dead, sitting at the right hand yeah. of God, the father and majesty. It's that's right. done. So that's the already, but not yet. Like, like you talked about. Yeah. yeah. The already, but not yet. So we've gone through this, this beautiful week, this holy week. Hopefully you've had the opportunity to participate in some sort of elements, uh, this, this holy week, whatever it happens to, whether it's Monday, Thursday, or good, good Friday. Friday um you know whatever you've done and now we're coming to the sunday where we can say he is risen he is indeed. risen indeed amen yeah. and um, hallelujah hallelujah and i think we've probably already been talking about it but like the discussion question you know think about the corinthians passage there no yeah. i've seen ear heard nor inner thoughts of man the glorious things which god had for those uh who who love him prepared for those who love him it's like I've said this before, I think too. I remember at seminary, there was a seminary I went to in St. Louis, and the professor uh, just talked about he he put his uh, alarm clock on an hour early. Then he needs to wake up, and he spent an hour just counting as many blessings and and wow. thinking about the future of like he would he would always say, "This life's good. Like I've got a good life." Think how inferior it is to the best life when when Christ you know consummates yeah. the kingdom and. It's a good way to live. It will help with the blood pressure, I think. <laughs> sure, sure. You know, because we talk about the mansion over in Glory Land, right? Yeah. Just um, over in the Glory Land. Just over in the Glory Land. You know, uh, I always, I always tell everybody, I just want a little cabin, just a little cabin on the edge of the woods. I'm good. You know, I, I will be, I will be extremely happy with that. I'm thinking right of there. the heavenly highway hymnal. They've got a lot of the mansion you, hilltop type songs and uh, over in the glory that's land. That's awesome. Where the streets that's are paved awesome. with gold. Anyway. Yeah. So what can you imagine that God and Christ has prepared for you? You know, if, if, <clears throat> if we do take stock and what an awesome way to start your day to take stock of all the blessings that you have, because we live in such a negative culture. Right. <laughs> oh my gosh. We live in a negative culture where we complain and whine about everything. What if we did just take stock of all the blessings that we have? If we started our day that way every day, just yeah. thank you God for, and, and create your list because it's long and it's huge. Um, and it's never ending when you really stop and think about all the blessings that God has given you. So if, if that, if, if you can think about that, just think about how much, Oh man. How great it is. Like Woo. the thing I'm looking forward to, this was a uh, C minute last week. I went down to McKenzie, um, uh, discipleship ministry team had a, um, work retreat so that we could make sure that we're working on everything we need to work on and trying to make a plan to develop all the things we want to develop, like, you know, websites and things. But, um, I took some time to go to Bethel university and I went in their little, um, they have like a memorial garden mm -hmm. um, and I didn't go to Bethel. Right. So like, I, I don't have this connection to that. I did for my master's degree, my MBA, but it was through online stuff. Anyway, as I was walking through their little garden, I, I saw names of like Pastor Norman, who was a 78 year, 76 year old man who preached the gospel on an Easter sunrise service. Um, and that's where I was uh, oh. converted. I saw the name of the founding pastor of the church with Pastor Norman then preached at. Uh, you know, because on the brick it said, this is, I forgot the guy's name, but founding pastor of the Hendersonville Carmel Presbyterian Church. And then I looked and there were people who like, you know, like uh, some of the teachers that taught the person who founded that church or Pastor Norman. And it, so anyway, I got what I, I'm saying all this to say, I think one of the glories that I will have when I reach heaven because of the resurrection of Christ is to know the plan by which God loved me and prepared me but then also yeah. to partake of the people who unknowingly, who maybe have died a hundred, a hundred years ago, affected my life. And I will know them as I know you, right? Yeah. Like I will have this family in Christ that, uh, that I had even no idea, but I'll have this yeah. instant family that's deep and connected. And that's beautiful to me. That is an amazing thought. 
I, well, it, it, I mean, wow. it, I thought, you know, any one of these, what, I don't guess the chain would ever be broken because God has his purposes, but I'm thankful sure. for all the faithful people. I don't know that I owe almost my soul to in some sense. Um, and, and I can't, yes, wait because of the ripple that. effect that happened. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's cool. That is a deep thought today. And teachers, I think I want to end, I want to end on that because that's, that is far reaching deep and wide thinking about how your life affects and touch not only those around you, but the future generations yet to come. Yeah. And, and what are, what are we doing to share that gospel message and share the story of the resurrection? How are we sharing that with, with others around us? Yeah. Hmm. Well, Reverend, great place. Christ yeah. is risen. He is risen indeed. All right. Hallelujah. Preach with grace and power and may the Holy Spirit do something amazing this week in your churches and, and we'll see you next week. All right. Bye everybody.